Beast. All right. Y'all ready? Yeah. Yeah. Someone, uh, someone commented on the video today that like they try to mimic me. They try to mirror me when I do the intro to the what's cracking <laughs> and they, they get it so wrong every time. <laughs> I gotta keep them on their toes. <laughs> what's cracking big dogs. Welcome bike to the channel. Welcome bike to the headquarters. This is the bunk bed breakdowns podcast featured film whatever you want to call it it is coming out monday this is a one-time thing it will normally be be bike on our wednesday schedule but we've had some logistical complications thanks to me and, and terrible or organizing and scheduling whatever it is it's out monday so you guys get the entire week to digest it and uh we're filming this on sunday night the packers and saints are playing right now so anything that happens in that game, anything that happens Monday night, we have not seen yet. But what we're going to do is quickly kind of just go game by game through Sunday's slate and talk about some of the things that we saw, some of the players that, you know, we might be looking to buy low, sell high, all that kind of shit that we normally do on a week-by-week -week basis. It's just going to be a uh, conversation between us three idiots. How are we feeling, boys? Feeling great. I love that compliment of being called an idiot right off the rip. Hey, it's, it, it's, it's okay because I call myself one, so we're on even playing field for now. I like it. It sets the bar really low, so when I don't know what I'm talking about, it like fits the narrative real well. <laughs> Michael? Let's get it, boys. Fucking ready. All right, uh, I'm going to hit the intro. In wild week. All right, so we're going to take this game by game, and we're going to dive in, and we'll talk. I guess, Noah, you already put something out for the Thursday night game, right? Yeah. All yeah. right, so we're going to skip through that, and uh, oh, my God, the first game on the list. Okay, <laughs> number one. Guys, I, I'm going to say this for like the fourth straight week. I expect these things from the Falcons. Like, I stopped expecting anything that will make me feel in a positive light regarding the Falcons, Okay. <sighs> I'm getting – the last comment I got on my Instagram was someone – someone uh, – <clears throat> I'm going to pull it up, actually. Someone dropped a phone number on my last Instagram comment, and I looked up what the phone number was, and it was a uh, – it was a suicide hotline number. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was Todd Gurley scored a touchdown, though. Todd Gurley really did fall that. into the end zone there, but so did Brian Hill. Brian Hill busted off a 35-yard touchdown run, uh, looked fast, and as I tweeted out, Todd Gurley – Looks fucking never. washed. Todd Gurley looks fucking washed. Just, just so bad. He came into the game with, um, with zero broken tackles on his like 37 touches this year. But being in the Falcons' offense, like this is the nature of what Todd Gurley might give you on a week to week basis. He's not going to be contributing in the passing game anymore. Uh, yeah. He's not really going to give you explosive runs, and you're going to have to kind of go into the game knowing that you're either getting like a, a an RB three, or if he scores a touchdown, maybe a high end RB two. Um, right now with a Gurley. Someone like that, are you just going to kind of let him sit there and, and uh, enjoy your flex spot? Or are you looking to ship him off immediately based on, like, just what we're seeing here and the shares? I mean, you, 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 good luck shipping him off, man. He's washed. I mean, I have him in our BDG Dynasty League. I'm probably just going to let him, let him be that depth flex piece. I mean, he's basically Jordan Howard now. Uh, so, I mean, you just got to play with it what it is. I mean, depth is important. Like, he still has value. But, like, no one's going to pay you, like, a first for him. And, like, if you're contending, like, you know, maybe you get a second for him if you can, but I'm not even sure you can get that, to be honest. What about, what about redraft, though? Are we looking to move him? Because I, I, I would – I'd be trying to dump him right now. Oh, yeah. I would I would package him up with, like, another wide receiver or another running back to try and get an upgrade. I, I would package him up with somebody, try and get James Robinson if I could. Um, yeah, good fucking luck. People who yeah, have James not. Robinson know who, know who <laughs> he is now. They got a fucking RB1 off the waiver wire. But in that same game – I mean, the bigger storyline is this. Uh, Nick Foles comes in from Mitch Trubisky, comes up and lights the Falcons past the up, which is like, yeah, you know, that's bare minimum. If you're an NFL <laughs> quarterback, you better fucking do that. And that's why Mitch Trubisky gets benched. But Terry Cohen, uh, supposedly we, I don't think we have official word yet, but probably yeah. tears his ACL. So within that game, I think like a uh, Todd Gurley for a David Montgomery flip makes a lot of sense there. If you could try to pull that off. I don't know if, you know, the David Montgomery owners is stupid enough in your league to do that, but you could probably <laughs> add a piece on top of that because, Tariq Cohen goes out, and then David Montgomery pretty much becomes the every down back. Um, he was targeting him downfield. He got, like, a fucking wheel route that was into the end zone. It was just, like, some trust that you saw between Nick Foles and, and his weapons there, and especially with David Montgomery. But we got our bounce back 
for Allen Robinson, 13 targets, yep. 10 catches, 123 yards, and a touchdown. And like all summer, we had been hyping up A Rob. We're like, this is it. This is this is his time. We got an elite wide receiver. We just need to wait till Nick Foles gets under center. Nick Foles gets under center. Allen Robinson pops off. So, like, thoughts on this game right now? We got the three cone injury, and then we got Nick Foles taking over this team. Oh, wait. Also, also, they came out and said uh, they're not announcing who the starting quarterback is for next week yet. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, do you think there's any chance Trubisky gets the job back? Like, the guy was the former number two overall pick. They give him <laughs> the reins to lead the offense in the first two weeks. They're 3-0, and and he got benched. So, this team is – I don't see any reason for them to go back to him. And as you said, he's so – like, Nick Foles isn't a good quarterback, but when you're compared to Mitchell Trubisky, anybody looks good. He made Jimmy Graham look like he was 25 again. He had six for 60 and two touchdowns. And I'm not sure he can run any faster than Todd Gurley at this point in his career. So uh, I'm thinking that this passing game is going to be looking up. As far as David, David Montgomery goes, to me, he actually looked decent the first two weeks. I didn't see much of this game at all. Um, but he looked decent. Their old line has looked a lot better than, uh, than I've expected it to look for some reason. Like, you know, they, they didn't add any pieces to it, but they've just, I guess, progressed. And uh, they've looked a lot better than, than mo- what most of us are giving them credit for going in. Yeah, and he does have a tough schedule coming up. He faces the Bucks, the Rams, the Saints. But peppered in or sprinkled in between those games is the Panthers, the Titans, the Vikings, the Green Bay Packers, the Lions. So there are a couple of favorable matchups there. If you can flip a Todd Gurley for David Montgomery, I definitely go for it. And the thing about flipping David Montgomery, just touching back on the Falcons offense, is we saw Chris Carson go down. And there's been so many injuries to running backs lately that uh, I bet that somebody had like a Chris Carson, uh, Saquon Barkley, or Chris Carson, Chris Carson, uh, Christian McCaffrey type of stack so if they miss both their running backs now you can probably flip them to that roster for a good uh, running back or a good receiver and I think that offers you a good buy low window for a guy like Dave Montgomery who didn't really produce this past week against a soft defense one of the uh one of one of my friends in the E-Town Get Down League has Saquon Chris Carson Dave Montgomery and Todd Gurley he's got fucking all, <laughs> all the running backs you just named so that was kind of funny uh any other takeaways from the Chicago Bears Falcons game I know like if you're a Rob owner that's got to make you feel like super secure now it was looking a little wobbly there because he was getting a lot of targets but like at the end of the day you know just because he's getting the volume doesn't mean it's predictive because it's coming from Mitchell Trubisky and those are going to continue to be shitty but Foles obviously gives him an upgrade in the passing game yeah this was a smash spot for for Allen Robinson I try to fit him in a DFS wherever I could um I'd say I'd say the other interesting part of this is like we got a we got a little taste of Calvin Ridley without Julio and he fucking balled out still so this guy is here to stay I mean he is he's killing it another he didn't get the TD but he got another 100 100 yards uh you know another massive target volume bunch of receptions like this guy's a top I mean he's a top 12 he's a top 12 dynasty wide receiver pretty easily just oh easily his yeah. um, um those, might of, be, those of you that fucking drafted him, uh, Ridley Lockett at the four or five turn in your oh, redraft baby. leagues, man, it didn't even matter what you did in the first three fucking rounds. Yeah. So, I mean, these are the wide receivers that, that absolutely matter. And, you know, people were, I feel like people got a little scared because like we tagged them with like that Chris Godwin type rise and everyone's like, you know, lightning doesn't strike twice, you know, obviously and here we are and he's fucking balling out. And I was worried about what he would look like without Julio. So I think this game was big for him just to show that he could kind of handle that handle that workload and uh that coverage even as the the lone guy even russell gage was out right i mean so it's like literally just him russell gage had a concussion yeah so he was he sat for most of the game um and then it became literally just like the calvin ridley show they they kept forcing it to their running backs and Gurley, and that's what the end of the game ended up being so please don't at me or tag me when anything happens to the falcons i literally don't fucking care (laughs) i'm not i'm no longer a Falcons fan. I we were in comeback. <laughs> mode. We were up twenty six to ten, and we were in comeback mode. Like I just felt, <laughs> like I, I feel it slipping away. Speaking of slipping away, the Buffalo Bills fucking steal one from the Los Angeles Rams, thirty five to thirty two. The very very questionable PI call uh, at the end of the game. And Josh Allen continues his hot streak: three hundred more passing yards, four touchdowns, another touchdown on the ground. So he tallies up five tugs, and Zach Moss misses one, and Devin Singletary pretty much just showed off that. He was probably the better running back in that backfield up to this point and will continue to be going forward. He gets like uh, 17 touches, goes over 120 yards from scrimmage. On the receiving side of things for the Buffalo Bills before we hop over the Rams, Cole Beasley has been like super, super involved in this offense. I know Diggs has looked fucking awesome, and Diggs should have had an extra like two touchdowns in this game. He had one that was called back. Yep. Um, I don't remember if he stepped out of bounds. There was, like a, there was a penalty. There was two touchdowns in a row he caught that both got – wiped out um but he ends up still scoring a touchdown Cole Beasley went six for 100 
Last week he caught, he went like five for 70. The week before that, I think he went like five for 55. So he's like low key, a very good wide receiver three in the PPR lens of things. And then Gabriel Davis is a kid that you brought up uh, a couple of weeks ago, Mike, because you were intrigued by him and he didn't do much in the first week, but he went four for 81 in this one. Yep. And he's looking like someone, uh, if he happens to be available on your waiver wire and dynasty, definitely to keep an eye on and redraft. I'm not really um, too intrigued by him because it's just going to be pretty much a dig show every, every week. And you're never gonna be able to tell um, when to throw a guy like Davis into your lineup. Yeah, he's definitely – he shouldn't be on your waiver wire. If he is, you should definitely right. go and grab him. He's a, he's a great prospect and, you know, someone that I was grabbing off waivers or with, like, the last pick in my in my rookie drafts. But, you know, kind of like you said, it, like, I look, I love Josh Allen. He's, he's been proven, proven, you know, everyone wrong. I think, like, the mistake that I made with Josh Allen, like, fading Josh Allen this year is almost as unforgivable as those who faded Lamar Jackson last year because it's a very similar type of story arc where – they're both like limit more limited in the passing game, but provide like huge rushing upside. Except Josh Allen's like basically a fucking goal line back, so he's got that going for him. Um, you know, we were gonna harp on like the easy matchups or whatever, but you know, this matchup wasn't that easy. They had the Rams, and even if he has an easy matchup and he smashes, like that, that still shows something. So, uh, Josh Allen might be, you know, might be one of the top top quarterbacks to to finish the season. And he's got a tough stretch down the road, so we'll see how that goes. But like, I mean, who cares? Because for the ten first like ten weeks, it's gonna be a smash every single week for him. Where do you have him in Dynasty, Mike? I know you had Carson Wentz ahead of him. That's obviously changed now. Do you think he's like a top five or six Dynasty quarterback? Because I think that they're going to lock him up for the long term the way he's been playing. Yeah, I don't know if he's top six because th- my top six hasn't really changed. But I will say like Carson Wentz is moving down uh, and Josh, uh, Josh Allen's moving up. Carson Wentz moved down and Joe Burrow moved up as well. So uh, he's kind of in that like top eight range. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I actually just started redoing my my dynasty rankings today. So we're going to have – we're going to completely rehaul our dynasty rankings, whatever we've had up to this point, make sure they're completely up to date on October 1st. So if you're not a Patreon member, that is where you shall get our dynasty rankings. We'll post them on October 1st. If you are, uh, then we'll give you a shout-out in the Discord as well as, you know, just via Patreon for our full dynasty rankings. I got Josh Allen at QB8 right now. Um, we have Mahomes, yep. Lamar Jackson, Kyler, Dak, Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson – uh, Joe Burrow at seven and then Josh Allen's right there right in front of Tua so um, Josh Allen is, is certainly I mean there's probably a lot of people that already had him up there but like this is kind of cemented him up there he's looked so so fucking good and now he's done it against a legit like Rams defense so it makes you feel uh, a lot better I think like the key takeaway to be honest is when it comes to quarterbacks like everyone is fucking terrible at judging whether or not a quarterback is going to be good in the NFL, whether it's everybody on Twitter. Like I feel like we've gotten good with running backs and wide receivers and kind of figuring them out as prospects, not obviously to a T, but way better than quarterbacks. Uh, We're just so fucking off on quarterbacks. Like, you know, we were against Josh Allen, but like everybody seems to be wildly inaccurate when it comes to quarterbacks. So like, really there's no sure thing one way or the other. There's no sure thing that Josh Allen's going to be bad. There's also like no sure thing that like Tua is going to be good when he gets onto the field. So it's like, um, I think, I think, you know, you just kind of get your guy if you like a guy. That, that's kind of what my outcome when it comes to quarterbacks now yeah. going forward. Yeah, everybody's convinced that Baker Mayfield will be the next big, big, next big thing. Same with Carson Wentz. Those guys have looked absolutely atrocious this year. Then you get Josh Allen, who nobody thought could throw the ball, and the guy's just slinging three to four touchdowns a week. And this is an offense, like, I brought up last week when I see the Vikings and the Titans. I'm like, that's a really good defense when they stink in real life. The Bills is an offense. I think of them as, like, ground and pound, hard-nosed defense. They're just slinging the ball, and Josh Allen's been very efficient this season. He's been very accurate, which is kind of surprising to me because he hadn't shown any of that through his first two years in the league. So uh, this is a really potent offense, and I know Mike had said it earlier that, you know, week one and two, they had very down, very easy opponents in the Jets and the Miami Dolphins. But a lot of people made that mistake with Lamar Jackson, as he brought up too, and the fact that he went out and he dropped 35 on the Rams just shows that this offense can really do it against any type of defense. Yeah, for sure. Um, I I think that, like – with um with these young quarterbacks like I, there's a, on the flip side of the ball like the the Rams and Jared Goff I feel like Jared Goff is kind of like he's not a great real life quarterback but he's pretty fucking good for for dynasty and and um and someone who's like relatively young and has his contract like locked up for a while so he's another guy that I see dropping down dynasty rankings that I think should be a lot higher than he's probably giving credit for on that side of the ball I mean he throws for over 320 yards against this Bills defense two touchdowns and I think the storyline here, other than, you know, Cup and Woods both go for over 100 total yards from scrimmage and a touchdown, but Darrell Henderson, man. So Cam Akers is out, and Malcolm Brown is coming into the game, like, questionable with his finger surgery that he had. Should have been at rel- relatively close to full strength, but Darrell Henderson takes over the workhorse role. He gets 20 carries, 114 yards on the ground, touchdown. Uh, Malcolm Brown goes 7 for 19, and Henderson out-targets him 3-2. to two. So going forward, like, for people that own Cam Akers in both – 
redraft and dynasty. Um, I know both of you guys were like very, very high on acres and dynasty. Does this, I know obviously this doesn't change the outlook of like what acres is as a prospect, but what it does is it like puts a wrench in everything for his first year, which is really big for projecting him going forward. So Henderson's success for this week could mean Henderson just continues to be very, very involved going forward. Um, and in redraft leagues too, like, are you looking to cap, or would you drop Cam Akers, honestly, on a redraft team, first of all, two, like, would you be looking to sell high on Darrell Henderson? Like, uh, let's unpack the backfield here a little bit. Yeah, I think it depends. For redraft, it depends on where you're at. Like, if you're 0-3 and you need to, like, make some moves and you need to drop Cam Akers, I can totally understand that. Um, but uh, so, he is dro- so he is droppable in your mind. Yeah, if, yeah. If you if you need the space, but if you're like kind of sitting pretty, uh, I would not drop him because, like I said, I just like to hold high upside guys on my bench versus like like depth wide receiver pieces you can kind of grab off the waiver anytime. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would hold in that instance. And then for dynasty, it definitely does throw a wrench in things because, like you know, the, the sad part is like Cam hey, Akers was looking good that game before he got hurt. So now he's like injured and he has a setback. And then like throw Henderson actually looks pretty damn good and explosive. He's still not getting enough volume in the in the passing game because I think Malcolm Brown's still soaking up a lot of that. Um, but like, if I can capitalize and, and kind of ship him off uh, in Dynasty, I think I, I absolutely would. Like, I would uh, I would probably sooner ship off Darrell Henderson than I would uh, James Robinson. I'll, I'll put it that way. I agree with that. Yeah. And for redraft, I think this is just a backfield I want to stay away from. Like, we can't forget that in Week One, Malcolm Brown basically had the game that Daryl Henderson just had, and then Cam Akers didn't look good Week One. Week Two, he comes out the gate as a starter. Daryl Henderson's week was very lowly, and then Malcolm Brown gets hurt. Now Daryl Henderson's the only healthy one. He puts up 20 for like 112 and a touchdown. I just feel like when all three are healthy, if they're healthy at the same time, it's going to be one of those backfields kind of like the New York Giants this past week where you think you know who's going to be the guy, and then they all have like eight carries for 34 yards and no touchdowns. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you have if you ended up picking up Henderson off the wire this week, you got to be kind of ecstatic because you got to assume that yeah. he kind of took – a hold of that backfield altogether and they get the Giants next week they're already 12 point favorites and the Rams have been uh just running the ball at a, at a crazy 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 rate I think they're number one in the NFL in terms of run rate so you know what they want to do but again it is it is kind of like a, a spinning wheel back there in the backfield and you don't know what you're going to actually get on a, on a week-to-week basis in terms of touches but they showed us pretty clearly what the fuck they want to do with Darrell Henderson he looked very good doing it so um, I think you could fire him up as as uh probably a high-end RB2 next week and depending on Cam Akers' health like I wouldn't be surprised if since they're such favorites and since Henderson looks so good they just let acres rest as long as he needs to because the uh the injury seems like a pain tolerance thing and like if he takes another crack at the ribs it's just going to be an elongated thing so henderson could probably ride into the sunset with him yeah he's going to put a wrench in uh acres rise for sure i mean the other interesting thing for this game is uh cooper cup man finally finally got involved finally led the team in both receptions yards and he got a tutty on top so he was actually he's killing it pretty nicely um i don't know what the shadow coverage was like, i'm not sure who trey white was on if he was on Robert Woods or uh, or Cooper Cup where he rotated. Yeah, but, I'm, not like, sure, I'm not sure what the end game was, but I know PFF had it projected where Woods was supposed to get shadowed by Tre'Davious White. So I think yeah. that was a little bit of hesitation, um, and that that would you know funnel a little bit of the targets to Cooper Cup. But like regardless, they both kind of balled out. Yeah, you, regardless what Robert Woods showed you is you just you just cannot bench him right because he's he's involved in the passing game. He had three tugs on the ground for 30 yards as well. He had a tutty so. Robert was just like an every week locked in starter, like everywhere I have him. I just don't even, he's like a set it and forget it type guy, you know, him, Ridley, those kind of guys in that value range uh, is going to be just, you just got to start them every single week regardless of the matchup because they're just, they're just too good to pass up on. Like you said though, the Rams offense definitely, definitely like pretty underrated, right? Like we didn't think this run game was going to have much, much run room like this, this run blocking unit, not elite by any means like the 2018 or 2017 years, but I guess another year of continuity, kind of similar to Chicago Bears, definitely helps him a little bit in that regard. And, um, you know, Henderson's got the burst, got the juice. I think we just got to give credit to Sean McVay, man, because he's like – he's just so – I know, like, people want to make fun of him because of the Super Bowl thing, but anytime a a coach can really adapt, like, a a completely new game plan, a completely new type of offense, like, we've seen it for three straight years now where he went from, like, this crazy run-heavy team with Gurley to a team that's much more pass-heavy last year, 12 personnel, to back to, like, a run game where he kind of fixed up the offensive line, man. I, I, I feel like he deserves a lot more credit as a coach. Yeah, he's definitely one of the better offensive minds and uh, pretty fluid. So you, you kind of want pieces of the offense. You know, we said Robert Woods didn't be the guy, but it seems like Cooper Cup's still the guy. Higby wasn't that involved last week, but he or this week, but he was last week. So there's a lot of good uh, fantasy pieces on that offense. 
Yeah, you know what offense does not have a lot of good fantasy pieces? <laughs> Fucking the Redskins, man, or the Washington football team. And uh, we were talking on air before this, but, like, it's Alex Smith time. It's time to see Alex Smith on the field. And uh, for Terry McLaurin's sake, we need it to happen because Terry – has his normal game four for 83 but like what his normal game should be is six for 120 and a touchdown because he just continuously gets overthrown he had one just unforgivable fucking throw by Haskins into the end zone (laughs) where it was like 10 yards out in front of him should have scored a tug and it's messy in the passing game he's going to continue to lead in targets because he's so good but like it's it's we're not seeing the upside that we need to from um from Terry McLaurin right now because of Haskins and we have Logan Thomas who is continuing to see a lot of targets at tight end, but he's not really, uh, you know, turning them into anything. I think he had eight last week. He led the team with eight the week before, and he had seven this week. So he's getting those targets, but um, he's not really producing them into anything. So I'd hold on to Logan Thomas if I had him in case you need, like, a, a filler because you don't see tight ends, you know, getting seven to eight targets a week pretty much. But um, other than that, I mean, not much, not much going on, on the Washington side. Yeah. Would you try to sell Terry McLaurin right now, knowing that the quarterback play probably isn't going to improve anytime soon for redraft uh, leagues? I – I feel like this is kind of his floor, though. That's, that's I would keep him because, like, yeah. week one, five for 70. Like, and then this week, four for 83. And the week in between was a pop-off game. So, I feel like his floor is really, really steady. Um, and you're not going to be able to sell him until he gets another one of those pop-off games. So, right now, I'm going to hold on to him. I did just make a trade in Dynasty that I want to see uh, what your guys' thoughts on. I think, I think Mike, you probably saw it because I posted it and you said something about it. So, um, with the C-Mac and Barkley news, in one league, I acquired C-Mac. In one league, I shipped away Barkley. So w- what's weird is because I think, like, Saquon and, and C-Mac got hurt at the same time. People are looking at these injuries as, like, an even playing field, you know? They just kind of like, oh, both top RBs are both hurt, like, time to ship them off. So, like, C-Mac is, is being bought at, like, a, a super discount, in my opinion. Um, so I was able to move Joe Mixon, Terry McLaurin, and uh, – Who's the other piece of the trade? No one good. I don't remember who the third piece was, but it was for C-Mac, Curtis Samuel, and a third-round pick. And I flipped C-Mac – or Curtis Samuel for Mike Davis. So I was able mm-hmm. to get C-Mac. I was able to get his handcuff, which I played this week and helped me win. But, like, I probably would have done that deal for C-Mac straight up for mixing yeah. Terry McLaurin. And um, I, I'll, I'll pull – you guys talk about it, but I'll pull up who the fuck I just – Yeah, easily. I mean, I saw that trade go through, and I was like – I don't understand why someone sold C-Mac for this, for this little, uh, like Mixon is, man. Mixon is just not, uh, not getting the usage. Like we, like he can be as talented as we want, but it's not going to matter if, uh, if Zach, uh, Zach Taylor continues to be a fucking idiot with his play calling. Like it's, it's actually like just brutal to watch. Cause, cause he's open a lot on the targets, but like you know, one Joe Burrow's looking downfield, which is actually good for his pass catchers, which we'll talk the, about later the on. Third, but, uh, uh, the third piece of that trade was actually your boy, Titty. Titty boy, TJ. Oh, oh, okay. Well, so, yeah, he had a big game. He had so, a big game. yeah, so that doesn't look great at, but yeah. So, oh, but still, still, even with Whoever even with Titty boy Higgins, the, the number one uh, goal line option on the Cincinnati Bengals it wasn't <laughs> yeah. it up being Higgins, but it was. It yeah, was, it was a good trade for me. I'm still feeling good yeah. about it. Yeah, even even with Titty Higgins, I think I think that's a good trade. And like CMC, I mean the the floor is just like so incredible, just given his volume. I think you're gonna have to be patient. Like, hopefully, you can weather the storm to actually last the you oh, know, six six weeks to eight weeks or whatever it is. But once he comes back, like if you're in the playoffs, like there's like no one else you'd rather, you'd rather kind of start, right? Like CMC, we always say CMC and Barkley in the same tier, but realistically speaking, like CMC is not in his own tier, is in his own tier. Uh, So I think, I mean, I think that's a good trade. Like I would try and make that trade all day if I was in a competing team. Yeah, I think you're right, Nick. People are just shipping off Saquon Barkley and Christian McCaffrey at like similar prices, even though Barkley's done for the year and Christian McCaffrey's going to be back in like a month or so. And the fact that you flipped him for a guy like Joe Mixon, who last year outside the second half of the year didn't look all too good because he wasn't getting a ton of usage. And then this year he's getting usage, but not in the way that we want. Like he's not getting any type of touchdowns on the goal line. He's not being used consistently in the passing game. He's a guy that I'm just slowly losing hope for because it doesn't seem like they want to use him in the right way. And even though he's like getting 17 touches on the ground, it hasn't been efficient either because the offensive line just isn't good. So I'm trying to ship off Joe Mixon if people are willing to buy him. And if you can get a Christian McCaffrey for him by just throwing in Titty Higgins and uh, Terry McLaurin, I'm a big fan of that type of trade. Yeah, I was, I was excited for that one. Um, so within that game, we were talking about we got the football team and we've got the Browns. Now, uh, Nick Chubb with another big game. It was yeah. his second consecutive week going over 100 yards on the ground and multiple touchdowns. So he honestly, I actually feel like Nick Chubb is low-key a sell-high candidate still. And we had talked about this a couple weeks yep. ago, but I'm more, I'm more so like pointing at redraft leagues. If you own Nick Chubb, the reason I say that is because he's had such big games and I think you can get a value – 
um, that's similar to like a high end RB one off of him right now. And the yeah. problem with, with, uh, the Browns and the way their offense is running is like they're not going to see these type of game scripts week in and week out. They played the Bengals, who didn't have Geno Atkins and Mike Daniels, and then they played the Washington, who also lost like Chase Young in this game, and they were able to dominate the game scripts. And I don't think that's going to be the case week in and week out. Obviously, their main game plan is to put the ball in their running back's hands. But like I think a lot more often than not, we'll probably see like 18 for 100 games from Nick Chubb not be very involved in the passing game and then score every other game, but not like what we saw here. Um, so for two of my like very, very big like sell high candidates would be both of the Browns players in Nick Chubb and Odell Beckham Jr. Preferably if you did that last week um, after yeah. Odell Beckham's big game. Yeah, we kind of talked about it. I mean, you remember you brought up like Mixon, Chubb versus uh, right. who was the third one? Eckler. Eckler. Yeah, so we said don't sell Eckler, obviously. And, uh, you know, Mixon has like the contract. Granted, he still stinks, but he at least has a contract. But I think Chubb, you know, we talked about him having like that image. Uh, you know, you can still always sell on the image because he is, after all, the most talented runner in the NFL. And I think these back-to-back games is really going to like just prop up that that narrative. It's not not narrative because it's true, uh, but it's going to prop up that image even more and kind of give you that, that sell window. Because if you look at his targets, I mean, he's had one target per game um, for the first two weeks. And I'm not sure how many targets he had this week, but like you still see – Kareem Hunt getting involved. Uh, he had, yeah, he had another one reception this this one this week. So, he in, in negative game scripts, he is just he'll still get the volume right, but you're not gonna get like multiple touchdown weeks every single week, especially like when he's breaking it from like 20 yards out. And you know, granted, he's he's very talented and seems like he can score easier from 20 yards out than he can from like on the goal line. Um, but you you just don't want to bet on that going forward. So you know what? Yeah. After after looking at their schedule. Um, yeah, it's real soft. I looked at it. it. Yeah, it's not like they're gonna be in that mu- in that many bad game scripts. They play at Dallas next week, and it's the Colts, Steelers, Bengals, Raiders, Texans, Eagles, Jags. They Ooh. get Titans, Ravens, and then the fantasy playoffs. They are against the oh, Giants wow. and the Jets. Yeah, I guess maybe so, not. Eh? Yeah, because yeah, so they got the Dallas game is maybe tough, and the Steelers game, it might be a rough one. But other than that, it's pretty pretty wheels up it's pretty beautiful so pre, uh, so pretty much just like don't don't do anything i just said in terms of selling <laughs> yeah, exactly guys. but but like i would absolutely still try to sell odell beckham jr man like the big game he had like he's getting like five targets a game tops and like yeah. they're not throwing the ball deep mayfield's throwing the ball 20 to 25 times a game um and i know the game script will be a little bit better but i just i, I don't know they, i just don't think odell has it anymore I, I don't think this offense really has it anymore yeah, I think the game plan is just keep it out of Baker Mayfield's hands as much as you can, and good things are going to happen. And if that means Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt are both going to get 20 touches a game, that's what's going to happen. But on your point of selling him high, I feel like what you could do is just ship off a Nick Chubb for like a James Robinson plus a piece, because James Robinson isn't a household name yet. But what he's been that's doing so, on the field has so been crazy. That absolutely right. Week three in fantasy football, and we're talking about shipping off Nick Chubb for James Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Well, plus a piece, maybe like a Keenan Allen on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's like exactly what I'm thinking right there, and and it's hard to pull a trigger on something like that. Like you do have to have um, a little bit of risk tolerance there, but I mean that's yeah. you know that's what you got to do if you're projecting forward. So let's move down to the Titans and the Vikings, where we had both of our top five running backs, you know, do their thing and cement why they're top five running backs. Everyone's worried about Henry. I don't know why the fuck you'd be worried about Henry because he gets another. 29 opportunities, 28 touches, 119 on the ground. Finally gets to the end zone, gets us two tugs. Uh, Ryan Tannehill does not score through the air, unfortunately. Hopefully, we'll get A.J. Brown bike soon. But on the Viking side of, uh, of things, this is where shit gets interesting. So, we have Kirk Cousins had a little bit of a bounce back, right? 250 yards, three tugs, two interceptions. Um, so, that obviously was not a positive thing there. But through the air, we had our Justin Jefferson breakout. Oh, baby. And as an Adam Thielen owner in, like, my most precious league, the town get down, we're doing well. We're going to be 3-0 and in first. But, like, Thielen has quietly pulled – he's, like, going to be my wide receiver three, I think, sooner rather than later. I tried to sell him after week one because I did not like how this Vikings offense looked. The problem is, like, when they're bad, they're really bad, and the players aren't going to do well. But when they're good, it's because Dalvin Cook did really well. And today we saw Justin Jefferson. Like, they've, they've been dying to get some kind of second weapon in the passing game, yep. and Justin Jefferson did it. Nine targets, seven receptions, 175 yards – and a touchdown and like uh you know I've talked about this before but I I talked to Brett Coleman like semi-often in the DMs and one of the first things he sent me was like Justin Jefferson is going to be the Vikings wide receiver one by Thanksgiving and I was like yeah I'll just fuck off I just drafted Adam Thielen like (laughs) no way you're right about that and after today's game I'm like 
shit, like, would I rather own just Justin Jefferson going forward? No, but like, obviously, it's a little bit of hyperbole. But how, what's your worry level on Adam Thielen? I'm still not worried. I mean, he's still getting, he still got the looks. He's still getting the red zone work. Like Justin Jefferson had a blow up game for sure, and that's why we. I mean, I don't, I don't remember if you did, but a, a couple of us, I think Noah did too. We had Justin Jefferson ranked as our wide receiver three behind Jalen Rager and Ceedee Lamb for dynasty purposes because he is, he is pretty talented. But I think having, like, I'm of the philosophy of, of this, right? When you have more good players on your team it's good for everyone so yeah. the fact that it's just adam Thielen and their offense stinks it's just Adam Thielen and cook that's not good now teams actually have to pay attention to justin jefferson and we know adam Thielen is still a good receiver uh so i think we're gonna get more of like a a not not digs because you know Justin jefferson isn't digs yet uh, but like more of like that type of offense where kirk actually has some more options to go to and it'll be good for their offense and moving the chains because i don't i don't think just jefferson will lead the in targets every single week I think he is definitely their wide receiver of the future, but I still think Adam Thielen is probably the best wide receiver on the team. Yeah, what concerns me about Thielen, though, is like these past three games were the perfect game script for him to be heavily involved. Like week one, they gave up 43 to the Packers. Week two, they lost by 17. This week was a shootout, and he just wasn't – like he put up touchdowns, and he put up decent numbers week one. But if you're not putting up like 50, 60 yards at least, like I don't have much confidence in you. But then on the flip side, you look at their upcoming schedule, and it's one of the softest pass defense schedules I've ever seen the Texans, the Seahawks, the Falcons, the Packers, and then the Lions again. So if you want to sell him now, that's probably going to hurt you in the long run because he gets like five or six really easy matchups in a row. Um, but as far as Justin Jefferson goes, I think a lot of people were worried that he'd be only a slot receiver in the NFL because that's what he played his last year at LSU. But he was on the outside a whole bunch, and he had a lot of really good uh, catch and run, like running after the catch plays where he scored his touchdown. I think it was like a 40, 50-yard touchdown where he broke two cornerbacks' ankles and he took it to the house. So he is definitely a dynamic playmaker. He put that 4-4 four, four speed. Uh, to the test I know when like a few months back we were watching the combine and just the group chat was blown up it's like Justin Jefferson ran a 4-4 four, four. I thought this guy's gonna be like a 4-7-4-8 four, <laughs> four, at best like T Higgins type of numbers but uh, he put those numbers to the test he looked like a very skinny version of AJ Brown out there and I agree with you guys he does look like the wide receiver of the future in uh, the Minnesota Vikings passing attack because he just seems very versatile and he's not just a cookie cutter slot receiver like a lot of people thought he'd be yeah but it, it was just like feeling uh, the allure for Thielen for me was the fact that we were going to just see so much volume, like the target share was going to be massive for him. And it was for, you know, it was eight targets the first week, eight targets the second week. And then it dwindled down to like five this week. And he, the reason I even put him as a sell high is because he scored the touchdown and the touchdown he had, like, had he not caught that, he would have put up like three points in this week. And it was like an incredible, incredible fucking catch by him. So I don't want to take that away. And that's like part of his game and what will keep him being a good fantasy wide receiver. But like, if, if I don't know if you can still get him for wide receiver one kind of price tag and, and sell him at that like I'm a little bit worried just for the fact that if Jefferson emerges and starts to see even like six targets a game that's going to come out of Thielen's target share and uh, if he's not getting the volume then I don't know how um, how efficient Kirk is going to be you know to make Thielen that wide receiver one. Yeah, I think yeah, maybe looking back to last year, what Adam Thielen did, he's having a very similar start. Like just going weeks one through seven before his injury, 43 in a touchdown, 75 yards, 55 in a touchdown, six yards, then 130 in two touchdowns, 57 in a touchdown, 25 in a touchdown. It was like really low volume, low output, but the touchdown saved him. And I'm kind of concerned that's what's, what we're going to see out of him going forward. Yeah, I think it's just probably relative market share percentage might go down, but I think also the total target volume goes up like this. This defense stinks, man. Like, I mean, they, they ran to a Titans who, who like, love to run the ball and play a slow game. But if they start playing against, like, faster-paced offenses, like, they're going to have to throw to keep up. Like, the Falcons, the Seattle Seahawks. Like, those are going to be, like, shootout games. And Kirk Cousins can absolutely shoot it out. And I think it's going to be good for – it's going to be good for him to have, like, both, both pass-catching weapons. Like I said, I think it's good to have a better offense with more weapons on it. Um, so, I'm actually still – I'm actually still in on this offense, and I'm actually still in on Adam Thielen because I just know he's a really good player. And the fact that he's basically dominating all the red zone looks is uh, is actually pretty promising. Uh, we just got to hope that, obviously, Dalvin Cook kind of stays healthy uh, for the offense. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, pretty brutal. Yeah, I'm going to hold on to him in the one league that I do own him in just because the team is doing well. You know, if it, if it ain't broke, do not fix it. But the Raiders – uh broke up a little bit today <laughs> not, not a good performance by them they lose to the Patriots 36 20 Cam gets absolutely vo I'm, I'm I'm going down my fucking team in, in one of my dynasty leagues and I'm like holy shit who did I leave on the bench with 32 fantasy points today 
lo and behold, it's fucking Rex Burkhead throwing up yeah. a 32 stack. So um, <laughs> the running backs in, in New England like might be the story here, but I don't even want to make them a story because then next week they're not going to be a thing. Basically, Cam just didn't get the goal line work, right? And I think last yeah. week we got in our head that like Cam was going to be a 350-yard passer uh, on the normal, and that's just not going to be a thing, right? This is this – is, we're going to get, you know, 200 passing yards from Cam, probably a touchdown, and hope that he gets one in on the ground. Uh, this week just happened to go to Rex Burkhead when they were inside the five yard line right. rather than Cam. So disappointing uh, day for Cam. But Sonny Michelle busts off a forty eight yard run. I didn't even know he was fucking capable yeah. of doing that. So like nine nine carries for one hundred and seventeen yards. I did not know Sonny Michelle was capable of doing that. Yeah, and and JJ Taylor leads the backfield in in carries eleven yep. for forty three. Uh, so realistically, like nothing positive to take away here in terms of like what you want to do going forward. I'm not going to pick up Rex Burkhead hoping that he is a, an integral part of the offense. Nope. Ben Michelle has just looked wash in every aspect of it. And this was like the first usable game he had. And really all he did was um, give you about 11 standard fantasy points. So, you know, that's probably his ceiling on a week to week basis on the flip side of things. Um, Henry Ruggs did not play in this one, which made Hunter Renfro, the goat kind of come out in full force six for 84 and a tug. Josh Jacobs catches another three balls. Nothing exciting out of his thing. I think the only storyline here really is Darren Waller kind of disappeared. Um, after his huge breakout game in week two, he catches just two of his four targets for, for nine yards. Um, is this a worry for you with Waller? It's not a worry for me necessarily. I just feel like this is the games that you're going to have when you have fucking fantasy tight ends because they all kind of stink, to be honest with you. But I'll, I'll keep Waller in there as a top five guy just with because the ceiling he has. Yeah, I'm, I'm not as worried because, I mean, all Bill does every time is, like, if you're a team that have a consolidated offense, and what I mean by that is, like, you have one or two guys that is your entire offense, which is the exact case with the Raiders between Jacobs and Waller, and we all know running backs don't fucking matter. So um, they basically came out and said, like, yo, we're going to eliminate Waller from the game, and that's exactly what they do. So, like, whenever you're going up against Patriots defenses, you are scared to start the best player unless like you have a diversified offense because all they do is just remove that one guy out of the game and force you to beat them some way else and that's exactly what they did they just bracketed him and you know like most tight ends can't beat bracket coverage uh and i don't i mean even if you bracket like travis kelsey it's gonna be the same result so i'm not too worried because they don't have to play the patriots every single week and i think he's still the best receiver on that team so uh going forward just gonna keep starting him the way i the way i do man looking at this box score Zay Jones and Nelson Aguilar are on this team. Like, what the fuck is going on in Las Vegas? <laughs> How are these guys rostered anywhere? <laughs> Bro, Gruden, Gruden just loves his fucking vets. That's why Jason Witten is there. Like, he just loves dudes that have been around the block, even if they're completely fucking a negative for their teams. <laughs> um, and, and, yeah, I mean, with, with Waller, like like you said, I mean, no one no one takes away the <laughs> the opposing team's, like, best weapons better than, you know, Uncle Bill out there. So, I guess it wasn't really a surprising outcome. Um, I, and one surprising outcome to me, I, th I thought, I thought the Giants plus four was, was a sharp pick. Turned out that was not. <laughs> oh my God, dude. I thought so too. I thought playing Giants defense was a sharp pick. Turns out. Oh, not hell at no. All. No. So turns out not out at here, all. Fucking throws up a 345 burger <laughs> and a touchdown. Daniel Jones just turns the ball over, uh, as much as he did in his rookie year. I think maybe the, the biggest storyline here is I guess we can look at both backfields because the Giants bring in Devonta Freeman. He goes five for 10 on the ground, which is not a surprise. <laughs> we have Wayne so, Gallman. Honestly, that's better than I thought he would do. Bro, listen to lie. the rest of this. Listen to this. Devonta Freeman, five for 10. Wayne Gallman, four for seven. Deion Lewis, one for fucking zero. <laughs> like Jeff Wilson, 12 for 15. It was like Matt Asiata across the board in that game. Bro, like nobody ran the ball well in this game. We fucking Brandon Ayuk is the RB1, yeah. apparently. Three for 31 on the ground. So, uh, Jarek McKinnon leads the backfield with 14 carries, 38 yards, and a touchdown. Jeff Wilson, 12 for 15 and a touchdown. Jeff Wilson also gets in through the air. Very involved in the passing game. Uh, McKinnon also does well through the passing game. But, like, I think um, – Going forward, like, obviously, McKinnon is the guy that you want to own because he's got the upside, he's got the explosiveness. But are you doing anything with Raheem Mostert? Because he's going to be back relatively soon. And I think that, like, for me, he seems like a good buy-low candidate because I, he just low-key might be the best playmaker in all the NFL. Yeah, yeah we he's both pretty like, Mike and I both like Jared McKinnon a lot, but it's no – it's no question who the best running back on this team is when they're all healthy. It's Raheem Mostert. Like, he had a few, like, 80-yard runs called back the week prior. And Jarek McKinnon, for as much as we love him and as much of an athletic had, had freak. a few 80-yard runs called back. Like, just <laughs> fucking <laughs> light work for most of us. <laughs> <laughs> he's like a 29-year-old running back with less career carries than Phillip Rivers, and he's just got a lot of juice left in the tank. But Jarek McKinnon, 
I don't know. I just feel like he's never been a good running back. And then he gets put in a situation where he's the starter. And we're like, okay, it's time for him to pop off. And he goes 14 for 38, like 2.7 to carry. That's just like the classic Jared McKinnon show. He does better move. Back up, but I agree with you, Nick. Like this offense with Nick Mullins is able to hang 36, albeit on the New York Giants. Um, but it, once Raheem Mostert is in the fold, they bring George Kittle back. They have Debo Samuel there. Like they have actual weapons to take away from defenses focusing solely on the running game. Raheem Moster, if it's not a serious knee injury, which it doesn't look like it's going to be, seems like a good, a good by low candidate because he's being used in the receiving game and he's just ripping off 70 yard runs like it's his job. Yeah, or you can be like me and an idiot, just sell him off for uh, Gordon <laughs> Sutton right before he goes on the fucking <laughs> IR. Um, but I think, yeah, I think I think Jerry McKinnon's got a role. Look, he's he's never been a good running back. We I've, I've said that for a long time. But uh, you know what's what's appealing is his receiving role. And he does seem to have some of that, even though they're they're kind of still spreading it out. But what you get with him is kind of like a, you know, like an RB two, RB two type play. He's getting he's getting some work in the in the red zone. He's getting some receiving work. Look, if if Raheem Moser comes back, we all know he's a lead. Um, but you know, at, in the meantime, it was kind of encouraging to see him lead the team uh, on groundwork. Um, but yeah, like it, it was kind of surprising to see uh, Brandon Ayuk kind of come out and just smash it. Uh, so that was that was nice to see for sure because he's getting involved. He's basically took that Debo role, right? He's he's like kind of getting involved in the short intermediate passing game, and then he's getting a couple carries here and there to kind of like light it up on the ground. So that was kind of exciting. But I'm gonna temper expectation on this whole offense because like the same shit happened last year. Nick Mullins came out and we all fucking crowned him the goat, and then he turned into <laughs> exactly what he is, just a backup <laughs> quarterback. And we got to remember that this is against the Giants still. So I think we got to temper expectations a little bit on this offense as a whole. Um, it's so yeah. funny how that happens in the NFL. Like backup quarterbacks come in for, at like halftime or they come in for one game and they just look fucking incredible. And then immediately the next week, they're just shit. Like Nick Mullins, like Nick Jeff Driscoll Nick. this past week. He got benched for fucking Brett Rippin. Driscoll. Yeah. Like, dude, it just happens over and over again. It's probably about to happen to, to Nick Foles, whoever they play next week. But like, he looked like an absolute god. And yeah. now, you know, like, I thought you were gonna say Justin Herbert right there. I'm so happy you said Nick Foles. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. We'll, we'll wait till we get to the Chargers game. Um, but for a more embarrassing game, you know, like if if the Falcons game didn't happen, this would be the laughing stock of the week probably. And it is the Bengals versus the Eagles. It oh ends my. up in a fucking tie, 23 <laughs> 23. So I don't know what's like the worst part of of this entire game. Was it like the play calling? Was it Carson Wentz? I mean, the offensive line loses Jason Peters now so they were already I'm pretty sure they were running out an entire second string line and now they're starting to dip into third string and dudes that work at Home Depot and shit but like this is this is a big problem for yeah. for Philly and and like I, Carson Wentz just looks so bad he looks bad their O-line was awful um I mean we gotta remember this is a beat up Bengals D-line without Geno Atkins without their best players and they were just in his face pretty much all day long and then because they were in his face, he's he was throwing up some pretty ill advised throws. He was missing Sanders on easy fucking check downs, just like inexcusable misses. Um, like this offense, like I mean, I bought into Miles Sanders because I thought this is gonna be a good offense. I scored a lot, they had a great O line, uh, his opportunity share was all good. And right now, I mean, he's basically a bell cow on a good team. He's basically a poor man's version of James Robinson. That's what Miles Sanders is right now. Sure. Um, <laughs> so now, on the on the Eagles side of the ball, though, there were two injuries. So we had Dallas Goddard, who left very early with an ankle injury. He did not return. So you have to kind of keep an eye on how serious that is. And then you had Deshaun Jackson, who basically dutted out for the game. Uh, after Deshaun Jackson got hurt. Deshaun, Deshaun Jackson did get hurt. <laughs> That is uh, that, breaking that, news every year. We break <laughs> news, take a fucking drink. Yeah, hamstring. So, like, I don't even know what analysis we can give on that. But, like, the reason we like the Eagles, like, oh, offensive line is going to be good. Lots of weapons. Yep. Like, this shit is going to look good. And then they're automatically reverted back to second half of 2019 <laughs> season again, which was yeah. Miles Sanders and Zach Ertz. Yeah. And, and Greg Ward, Greg Ward, wide receiver one. <laughs> exactly. He's the best so, quarterback like, and receiver on this team. <laughs> So, like, Greg Ward is absolutely a pickup. He actually led the team in targets with 11, caught 8 for 72 and a touchdown. Zach Ertz went back to his 10 targets, 7 for 70. And that's the kind of games we're going to see when Goddard isn't – and, like, this is even better for Ertz because last at the end of last year, Goddard was still out there and producing, but now Goddard's not there. So, Ertz seems like, you know, for those of you that drafted him in the fifth, sixth round, you kind of caught a lucky break, but it's going to be nice yeah. for you going forward. Miles Sanders had fucking 20, uh, 26 opportunities in this one after having 27 the week before. Goes for, like, an unimpressive 107 total yards, but eight targets, man. And Wentz missed them just fucking absolutely over to him. 
on a 50 yard. Yeah, dude, it's even the ones that are like three yards in front of him. Yeah. He just overthrows him. I'm like, Every what time. the fuck are you doing? And <laughs> overthrows him on a 50 yard walk in touchdown that he would have had down the field, which would have made Sanders look like an elite RB1 at this point and not a fucking poor man's James Robinson. So watch, <laughs> watch your mouth over there. Um, so I'm feeling good if I have Miles Sanders because the opportunity is so fucking high. But like, I don't, I don't know what to make of this Eagles team, man. Yeah, they honestly, Mike, are you going out and trying to buy Jalen Hurts right now? Because this uh, does not look like the answer. No, because I already have Jalen Hurts everywhere. So. I knew that was gonna be the answer. I should <laughs> even ask that question. Um, um, yeah, but on the Bengals side, on the Bengals side, look, Joe Burrow looks like the real fucking deal, and, oh, yeah. and he he's balling out. And look, the the Eagles don't have any world beaters on the defensive side, but they do have Darius Slay. Man, it, it's a it's a tough matchup there for AJ Green. So AJ Green basically got a race, but in his wake. Our boy Tyler Boyd. I mean, I had I had the force uh, four screen up uh, split screen from the Sunday ticket, and every time I looked over to the Bengals games, it was literally Tyler Boyd catching a pass, and every single time it was like Tyler Boyd first down, Tyler Boyd first down, Tyler Boyd first down. So it, it's beautiful to see him get involved, but more importantly, it's beautiful to see my boy Teddy Higgins, who both of you disrespected nonstop all off season, to just go off for five catches, forty yards, two tutties. It's clear that he is the wide receiver three in this offense. It's clear that he is the future once A.J. Green gets fucking pushed to the wayside. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful pairing between Burrow, Boyd, and Higgins. Rest in peace, Joe Mixon. I don't know what the fuck to do with you, but the, the pass catch is going to be beautiful. And I'm going to remember this day because it's the day that everyone got to see what T.D. Higgins was all about, and you guys can just fucking suck a cock. Gosh, Mike, how are you going to call him the wide receiver three when Gio Bernard put up three for 55? <laughs> like, you can't be doing that. <laughs> All right, let me ask you. Uh, actually, we didn't, we didn't talk about <clears throat> in the last game, Debo Samuel is going to be activated off of IR. I don't know if he's going to play in week four right away. Um, they but they do. Five, he's likely to play. Yeah, they're likely to play week five. So, like, who, who for a season-long pickup between Ayuk? Because Debo Samuel is not going to be on anyone's waivers. He was in everyone's IR spots. But between Ayuk, T. Higgins, and Greg Ward for season long, right? These are obviously guys that you don't want to throw them into your lineup, but they're guys that, you know, uh, at this point in the season, like you're going to have to look for flex roles. And I'm going to be honest, like with Debo coming back, I'm not too interested in Ayuk and the Bengals offense on a week to week basis. I, I don't know what we're going to expect. Like you brought up Slay and he's, you know, he's not Slay what he was once, but he was on AJ Green all game and uh, he kind of took the pressure off the other receivers. I don't know what we're going to get from Higgins on a week-to-week -week basis, but, like, Greg Ward legit operates as a wide receiver one when fucking Deshaun Jackson's hurt and, um, and Jalen Rager's is going to be out for the foreseeable future. So, like, I kind of like Greg Ward the most out of those three. Yeah, yeah that's where I'd go, too. The good. thing about Brendan Ayuk is he plays basically the same exact role as Debo Samuel would, except yeah. Debo Samuel's pretty good at football, where Brendan Ayuk probably shouldn't have been a first-round pick. Uh, Titty Higgins, guy stinks. And then Greg Ward, like Dallas yeah, Goddard. People are hurt. not going to like uh, those comments. You're going to have I can't wait. Strong I mean, I'm wearing a back. fucking headband and a man bun, so I, I get all the comments I need anyways. But then uh, <laughs> on the other side of the ball, the Philadelphia Eagles, they lost Goddard. They lost Deshaun Jackson. Jalen Rager, my wide receiver, one for Dynasty. Rookie drafts this past year. He's He's gone. Rest in peace him. So, yeah, it's got to be Greg Ward because it's going to be a decently high-powered, not high-powered, but high-volume passing offense. And he's the only one on the team with hands other than Zach Ertz and Miles Sanders. But to be honest, like, Miles Sanders doesn't have hands because Carson Wentz can't throw to those hands. So, I definitely pick up Greg Ward of those three. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, the other thing to remember is Kittle was also out this week. Um, yeah. So, if he comes back and Debo comes back and you're a low-passing volume offense, it's going to be kind of tough to, to play that role. And like you said, like, Ayuk and Debo kind of play the similar roles. I don't know if I'm like, I'm like rushing to get to get Greg Ward either. Um, no, but if I, I don't, I, I, I mean, none of them are like exciting yeah. to off the waiver wire. But yeah, but if you need a wide receiver three kind of plug in for that flex, you know, you kind of be that guy. But like, just understand that you know, there's some weeks he'll give you like six points, and then on a boom week he'll give you like 14. So um, nothing, nothing too too exciting there for me. But yeah, he's he's definitely someone where. It's a great story, man. It's a great story. Like these guys, I love when these guys just like come out of nowhere. Like this guy, nobody knew about him last year, came on the scene, and actually used them in my dynasty leagues. My wide receivers were fucking bare. And he kind of helped me to help me, uh, you know, throughout the weeks. But yeah, I wouldn't get too excited about any of them uh, on a week to week basis because it's going to be tough, tough to see that volume.
All right, let's try to move through these quickly because the game by games take a long, long <laughs> fucking time. We're, we're almost at a fucking hour already. I didn't realize. All right, Texans versus Steelers. Steelers win 28-21. I'm going to run through the Texans side uh, really quickly. As we already knew, the Steelers' run defense was really good, combined with David Johnson being really bad on the ground, 13 for 23 on the ground. I think the only real story takeaway here is that Will Fuller left last week's game with a hamstring injury. I didn't play him anywhere in my lineups because I just did not trust him going out there on less than 100%. But he sees five targets, four for 54, and a tug. So next week I will be comfortable rolling him back out into my lineups. On the flip side of things, Anthony McFarland starts off his Hall of Fame career averaging 7.0 yards per carry, leads the NFL. Um, so that was good to see. Now it was good to fucking see him finally on the field after being a healthy scratch for a couple of weeks. But it does look like James Conner is uh, absolutely the workhorse here. 18 carries, 109 yards, and a tug. Also five targets, four for 40 through the air. So yeah. uh, James Conner – you know, the, the, the roller coaster season for him where some people liked him in the offseason, he was very polarizing going into the year, gets hurt immediately, then comes back and takes his workhorse role. If you own James Conner, you're just, you're, you're just going to ride this out, right, and just hope he continues to put up RB1 numbers. Yeah, I mean, unless you can, like, try and flip another workhorse running back, which, like, most people aren't going to be willing to do because of the injury history. You just got to – with with guys like these, you just got to hope that he lasts, man. You just got to hope he lasts long enough to kind of carry you through what you need to be carried through because the work volume is good. But, I mean, the other thing you got to point out here is, like, Houston Texans is a run funnel defense. I mean, yeah. everyone is going up against them as averaging, like, six yards per carry, looking like fucking Hall of Fame players. So, if you got a good running back going up against them, just plug him in. Uh, also, uh, Deontay Johnson left the game with oh, a yeah. concussion, and he did not return. So keep an eye on that. I mean, most most guys end up being able to return from the concussion protocol for the next week's game, but it is something to monitor, and uh, James Washington would probably be the next guy up. We saw Eric Ebron get pretty involved in the passing game too, so could be on the tight end streaming radar. Anything to add there, Mr. FB God? Yeah, I'd say in this game, David Johnson, for me, I can't believe I'm about to say it, but he looks like a good buy-low candidate because these past two weeks he hasn't been great, but he's the workhorse there. He played Baltimore yes. and Pittsburgh, which are two tough defenses. You look at his upcoming slates, Minnesota, Jacksonville, Tennessee, Green Bay, Jacksonville, Cleveland, all in a row. The receiving game work isn't as consistent as, we, as we'd hope for a guy that has his type of skill set, but just seeing as how he's getting all the looks and he had two bad games against two really good defenses, and he gets like five or six easy ones in a row. Uh, not that I'm saying I'm going to trade a Nick Chubb for him or anything like that, but he's somebody that people were very low on heading into the year because we haven't seen him be good in a long time. Who, who, who was? Who, David <laughs> who was, Johnson. Who was low on David Johnson going? <laughs> not us, I, not me. It, it's a really good point. I was going to actually bring that up. I forgot to. If he didn't score a touchdown, he would be like the premier fucking buy low candidate because he did get in. So people, you know, he, he's gotten like 99% of the running back touches since Duke yep. Johnson went out with his ankle injury in week one. And it's like, the matchups of the Steelers Ravens is just so fucking tough. Like you couldn't have expected him to do well in those. Yeah. Yep. And in week one, when he was running against the chiefs, he actually looked good. And my mentions blew up and then <laughs> that victory lap lasted one of 12 quarters that's been going on for that team. So I think it's a good buy low candidate. So if he does do well, I'm on the right side of history. If he does do poorly, he's over 230 pounds. You can't hold me liable. You're on the right side of history either way. Let's talk about the Jets being on the fucking wrong side of history. There is it, one. There's just, there's actually, you know what? James Connor or James Robinson. Going forward, season long. Ooh, Fuck. that's tough. I'd that say James tough. Connor, just yeah. because we know. I guess we know it with James Robinson too, but we don't know the injury history of James Robinson. I don't know. I'm just gonna go with Connor, just because. I can't make an argument because James Connor, James Robinson is also getting the work workhorse type of workload. It's like you want to say, oh, I just love the game too much. Not gonna be there. Blind, man. Yeah, it's like game script's yeah. not going to be there, but then it's like, okay, but he also catches passes and shit, so. Yeah, you know. game script hasn't been there for, th yeah. for three weeks. He's won, I'd, so. say, I'd say I'm leaning, I'm leaning Connor a little bit in redraft just because, like, like I said, you kind of just got to bank on these guys to stay healthy, and Connor does have a workhorse role. You know, we kind of joke about uh, James Robinson being a bell cow. He's kind of not there yet. The, the, the snap split was actually pretty even, like 50-50, especially when they're getting blown out. There's a lot of Chris Thompson out there, so, uh, some Dare of Gumbo Ale as well. Um, whereas like Connor, you know, he's also on a better team, a better offense with a good defense. So probably lends to better run, run scripts. So I'm like, I'm like barely, barely edging out Connor by, by a little bit there. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go the same way. It fucking hurts to say it though. It's, it's not <laughs> something I feel good about. Um, yeah. there's literally nobody on the jets that you can roster at this point. They're, <laughs> they're fucking trotting out of high school. Braxton Barrios. Uh, hurdle. He just got fucking smacked oh, in the yeah. mouth. <laughs> Bro, like they're just, they're drawing up like screenplays for Kalen Balaj on, on third and 36. <laughs> I and, saw him like, wow, Bilal Powell got big in the offseason. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking picked up uh, the Indy Colts defense like two weeks ago in E-Town get down for this fucking matchup. And they put up like 27 points for me. They started the game off with a pick six, got another pick six, a safety. It was 
Uh, it was a fucking beautiful sight. On the cold side of the ball, uh, Michael Pittman got hurt. I'm not sure if he came back in, but Paris Campbell is obviously hurt. And Jack Doyle was supposed to be like all systems go, but he didn't see a target or anything. I don't even know if he was on the fucking field. Mo, Mo Ali Cox was <laughs> sludging his fucking junk. Slow Mo, everywhere. baby. Slow Mo. He- Slow Mo tug, tugs score the same amount of fantasy points as fucking fast forward tugs do. <laughs> and he got in the end zone again, man. Three targets, three catches, 50 yards. Um, he seems like a legit waiver wire pickup for, for the tight end spot because I don't know what the fuck Jack Doyle is doing, but we didn't get the bounce back game for T.Y. Hill. The passing game is just not there for, for Indy. So, so bad. Who would have thought so with Phil Rivers at the, uh, at the helm? So bad. The passing game. And yeah, Naheem it, Hines it, is basically Austin Eckler, though. Seven carries for 21 yards. <laughs> four for 40. Love, love that. Um, yeah, so not much to talk about here. I mean, J- J- JT didn't have the upside game that we had kind of wanted, but the Jets are low-key like a pretty good run defense, so you can't just shove it up the middle against them. His high-end RB1 games will continue to come. Talking about high-end RB1 games, Austin Eckler, man. Shout-out to all the people that sold him after week one. Shout-out to Justin <laughs> Herbert. Salute you, idiots. <laughs> Shout-out to Justin Herbert for throwing the ball 30 times to Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler. Uh this, this is what I expected the Chargers to be from the start. This is why we liked Eckler, because we figured that they would be down early and they would be down often, and this led to 11 targets for Austin Eckler, which is a beautiful thing to see. Justin Herbert, like, got hurt for about 0.5 seconds. Yeah, we were scared. And I thought he broke his arm or, like, broke his collarbone or something, and yeah. then he comes back in on – on the net, he's way too strong for it. Yeah, and <laughs> Anthony Lynn couldn't wait to get him off the field, to be honest. He's probably so happy. He's like, yes, yeah, so I get to put fucking fire on uh, but he he has his rookie woes, man. He he had some plays where, he, you know, th- it, this is probably more like what he is, where yeah he's going to have a really strong arm. He can hit you deep. He can hit you all over the field. And then he has some really fucking boneheaded plays where you're like, bro. Wh- Should have what- had another pick. Um, the guy dropped yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, so uh, Justin Herbert is, I mean, he's streamable in, in super flex leagues, I guess, but gives me a lot of hope as an Austin Eckler uh, owner. I, I really liked what I saw there. I think Mike Williams also – might have got hurt, but I think he might have came back in as well. But it's arrows up for Eckler, arrows up for Keenan Allen. On the flip side of things, man, like there's a very real debate here. I don't even know if it's a debate right now for redraft for season long. Like I, I think I'd straight up take Robbie Anderson over DJ Moore going forward. He's looked oh, so good. Dude, he was always a guy I loved in, on the Jets. I've owned him almost every year in my home league, and he always fucking burns me because he puts up like seven for 125, six for 150, and then it's like two for 18. But you're part of the Jets offense. You have Adam Gase calling the shots. That's going to happen. I actually have him as a buy low. I know it's going to be tough because the first two weeks, he's basically like the third best receiver in the NFL. He put up a dud game, but you're being shot by Casey Hayward in a very good pass rush where you're not going to be able to get the ball out deep to him. But you look at the uh, type of matchups he has going forward. Arizona, Atlanta, Chicago, New Orleans, Atlanta, Kansas City, Tampa Bay, Detroit, Minnesota. He doesn't have a buy until week 13. He's a legit wide receiver too or a flex option for you for the next like almost 10 weeks, two and a half months. And he's looked very good. He's been the target leader on this team. Uh, thus far and Teddy Bridgewater and him have a connection and I also didn't know that he was coached by Matt Rule back in Temple so maybe yeah, that's yeah. Like, that was the whole thing yeah, yeah there's him him Teddy know. and uh and uh Robbie they have all of history it's actually incredible right like I I had a deal I don't know if you saw it but in what to do dynasty with uh, snacks where I gave up uh Daniel Jones uh and and like Robbie Anderson for like Mark you got 45 dollars tab no. For Mar- no, for Marquise Brown uh, in a first and a second from from Snacks. And, you know, at that point, I was like, look, I'm going to give you Robbie Anderson. I know he's not worth that much, but he's like a nice flex play, a nice wide receiver for you if needed. And who the fuck would have known that he's like a top – he's a wide receiver one right now um, over, overall in the season. So, look, just goes to show, man, we don't fucking know shit. And, and Robbie Anderson, Spaghetti Anderson is, is going to be out there. He's going to be a real deal. And the fact that you saw him produce – like the fact that you see him getting used on like slants and short intermediate routes, getting those like low – that's what uh, I mean. Low, he's he's getting all the targets that we figured like DJ Moore would be yeah. getting. And he's not yeah, getting exactly. I think I think maybe the lesson to learn here is like there was so many moving pieces going into Carolina this offseason that we probably shouldn't have projected DJ Moore at his ceiling. You know what I mean? Like I think everyone mm-hmm. was drafting him top ten, just projecting yeah. what we saw last year when it was the quarterback change, the coaching change, bringing yeah. Robbie Anderson in. So there's a there's a lot to go around there. And uh yeah, like I feel bad for the DJ Moore owners. I don't own him anywhere in redraft, thankfully, but I do have him in dynasty and I'm just going to kind of hold on hope there and, and hope, you know, the offenses with a new coordinator, with a new head coach tend to get stronger as the years go on. And I mean, Teddy Bridgewater hasn't been fantastic uh, to say the least. So uh, also good to see Mike Davis kind of do his thing while Christian McCaffrey was out. So if anyone picked up Mike Davis as, you know, the handcuff down King, 
fucking eight receptions again, um, <laughs> 45 down, yards King, and a touchdown. Yeah, so so Mike Davis, like, you don't even need C-Mac when, when Mike Davis got here fucking balling. <laughs> yeah, C-Mac, C-Mac is a – Pass the torch to him as a new Austin Eckler. And Austin C-Mac, Eckler is <laughs> C-Mac is the poor man's uh, Mike Davis. So we got Mike Davis going out there now, balling out. Um, you know who's the poor man, Ronald Jones? <laughs> Leonard Fournette, <laughs> dude. The, the the funniest shit I saw on Twitter was like, you know, there's like certain Ronald Jones shoots like Nick Will and like I think he had like Ronald Jones like RB one above like Saquon whatever it was, sure. uh, but like he tweeted out like, oh, like Ronald Jones, like this is his stat line. He tweeted out like Leonard Fournette, this is his stat line, and you know I was told that Leonard Fournette's a starter, and then someone else right after him, I like, tweeted out like when both running backs in Tampa Bay have a bad game, and they put out the like uh, fucking Thanos. When he like gets the when he gets the gauntlet like power. Yeah, scene. I saw you tweet that, and I was like, I fucking. <laughs> Sounds like dude, so funny. And like someone else said, like, dude, only Ronald Jones truthers like celebrate when both backs have a fucking shit <laughs> <Yeah>. game. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So I mean, Ronald Jones, like, this is gonna be the problem with the with the Bucks backfield. And like, this was the game script for one of them to pull away, in, and it just didn't happen. And I listened to a few podcasts over the previous week, and people that are like close in with the Bucks and listening to beat reporters and they're just like this is going to continue to be a Peyton Barber Ronald Jones situation uh throughout the year and one of them might have a good game one of them might not have a good game and like vice versa it's Fournette's obviously the shiny toy there because he has the upside of breaking that long run but it's going to be really hard to trust either of them going forward uh in redraft leagues Ronald Jones goes 13 for 53 Leonard Fournette seven for 15 and uh, Ronald Jones tops him in targets four to two I think there are a couple other takeaways here, though. Chris Godwin limps off with a hamstring injury after going three, five for 64 and a touchdown. So he was back, and then he leaves. And now this seems like something that might be a little bit more serious. It was, it was a non-contact injury, which is weird on, uh, on a hamstring. Like, he was just, like, kind of out of the play and, you know, wasn't yeah. running at full speed or whatever. But obviously uh, – I, dude, honestly, like this offense is so weird. Mike Evans, his stat line today. Oh my God, he's Jordan Howard. Who the fuck? Mike Evans years. is Matt Asiata. Weeks one and three combined, <laughs> three catches, four yards, three touchdowns. Bro, did his stat he might be, he's got to be the first, uh, and shout out to Bats for this, he's got to be the first person ever in the NFL to just have a stat line of 2 2 2. I was like, he's, <laughs> he's just Jerome Bettis through the fucking air. And like, you know, we, we, were, we were excited about Scotty Miller last week, and now maybe it's time to get excited about Scotty Miller again because he leads the team in receiving yards with 83. I think he's a good fucking uh, a good playmaker man and he, he left a couple yards on the field like making amazing catches but his foot was like out of bounds I think he's legit and I think he could be someone that could uh despite what he did last week and put up a dud for most people man don't don't fucking play Scotty Miller emotionally all right use your head he's a good player and now he's going to fill in for Chris Godwin um so I like Scotty Miller as a pickup this week the the backfield is is discouraging the entire fucking Broncos offense is wildly discouraging because Jeff Driscoll comes in and takes a shit on himself and gets benched <laughs> in the fourth quarter. Brett Ripping comes in and like rips off. A, he went eight for nine, but he threw a, a bad interception up the middle. Uh, the backfield was disgusting. Eight for 26 for Melvin Gordon. Uh, no one did well in the receiving game, but Jerry Judy did see nine targets. Noah Fant saw 10 targets. A lot of people uh, were getting high on KJ Hamler and for good reason. He's a good player, but he only sees five targets, three for 30. Uh, anyone in the Denver offense are going to be excited about while Drew Locke and, and Cortland Sutton are out. I have Melvin uh, Gordon as a buy low just because he had a terrible game. And I know Philip Lindsay looks to be back next week, but they play Thursday and they're playing the Jets. So I don't see any reason to try him out. And the Jets, although they kind of did shut down Jonathan Taylor a little bit, they didn't really need to use Jonathan Taylor all that much this past week. So we get to the Jets, which is pretty easy. Miami, which is easy. Kansas City, which you can run on them. Atlanta, the Las Vegas Raiders, you, you and then the, the Chargers and six there? of the next seven. You skipped the Pats in there. I see what you did. Yeah, I said six of the next seven, you know. Okay. I was going to leave that one out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's a. I mean, I, I'm not that excited about this offense as a whole. Like, e- honestly, even with Drew Lock, there, I don't know what happened to their O line, but they're who's O-line. the worst quarterback in this, on this team? That's the real question. I think. <laughs> is it Ripian? Is it Lock? I don't fucking know, Drew, man. Driscoll, man. I don't know. I was excited about. I own Jeff Driscoll in like most of my dynasty league. Same. And I was like sick. I, I got like a random quarterback out of nowhere, and now I'm just like, now I don't have Jeff Driscoll yeah. anymore because I mean, they were going to get the start. They were in his face like all day yeah. long, and, and I, I played like box box defense for DFS because I felt it was a pretty good, damn good matchup. But like that old line was getting absolutely fucking destroyed. Like he had no time, and let's let's get it straight here. Like Jeff Driscoll is no, I mean he's no Russell Wilson or Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson, so he's not gonna really get out there and and kind of escape the pocket and throw dimes on the run. But yeah, that that team looks brutal. That offense looks brutal. If I had to like grab anyone, like I think I'd. I might still hang on to Hamler for cheap just to see how he kind of evolves. Like five targets is, is still a decent amount. Um, and he kind of has that big playability. But, yeah, it's a tough offense to get behind, man. 
I remember yeah. we were comparing them to the Chiefs uh, after the draft, and and look at us now. I'm like, no, 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 stop. <laughs> we weren't comparing them to, <laughs> to the fucking Chiefs. We were saying that they were trying to catch. They were a very, yeah. very poor, 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 poor man's version yeah. of the Chiefs, and uh, we're seeing why being very poor is not a good thing. And that's the Broncos' <laughs> offense now. The Lions, Cardinals, twenty six to twenty three. Lions take a dub. Um, otherwise, Matt Patricia's job was probably up in the air after this one if he didn't pull one off. So we have Adrian Peterson dominating backfield touches, 22 for 75. Like Work running. Horse. Yeah, running like he's the fucking 2009 Adrian Peterson. Uh, DeAndre Swift doesn't get a single carry. And he <laughs> sees two targets, catches one of them for 19 yards. Like He played five snaps today. Yeah, like I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know what to say there. Like he played five steps. So he and DeAndre Hopkins in the same game continue to embarrass me, like to a wild, wild degree. <laughs> DeAndre goes ten for one thirty-seven. Uh, good to see Kenny Galladay back in the lineup, though. Uh, ties yeah. for the team lead, seven targets, six for fifty-seven, and a touchdown. So if you draft him in third round, uh, you could feel confident starting him going forward. Uh, fuck, man. Like Marvin Jones, a- Marvin Jones, uh, he had that big play called back that, that game ceiling touchdown, uh, cause of a holding, but he looked, right. he looked pretty damn good too. I think him getting holiday back was, was good for that entire offense. I, yeah, uh, I think for I, me, another by low candidate's Kenyon Drake. And we said it last week. It's yeah. just gotta be a week. That's this guy does something. I mean, <laughs> he's Simmons, his role isn't increasing, but Kyler Murray just takes all his rushing touchdowns. He's not getting receptions. I'm just going to die on the bye, Kenyon Drake Hill. It's going to be 13 <laughs> going into the playoffs. I'm like, guys, the trade deadline's over, but convince the owner to drop him because he stinks and then pick him up. But I don't know. Convince your commissioner to move good. the fucking trade deadline back so I can get Kenyon Drake. <laughs> He's going yeah. to win you the league just like, just like last year uh, in that time. I mean, he still played 70% of the snaps, uh, got most of the opportunities. And look, like he didn't score, uh, but he, he looked decent on a couple of plays. But yeah, it's, it's definitely disappointing to not see him on the receiving game. I mean, they're just not really passing to him like, DeAndre Hopkins is literally he's just yeah, it's, he's, it's he's fucking he's the fucking Thanos of targets. Like he's just getting absolutely everything. Uh with Christian Kirk out, like, you know, our boy uh, Andy Isabella had had a, had himself a game with two tutties, but it's it's the freaking DeAndre Hopkins show. That's all that's all Kyler Murray is looking for. Uh either that or he's running. So it's disappointing. But he's like, you know, you kind of get, you know, a poor oh man, my God, a poor man's Derrick Henry. Alvin Kamara is just so good. It makes him, he just go he just lubes himself up before every game. And you just cannot <laughs> tackle the man. Uh, I let me and Noah both laugh at the same time. And you're like, yeah, Kenny Drake. You know, he he looked good on on a couple plays. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like 25 opportunities to do so. I know like, he keeps oh, getting 20 this. touches and keeps disappointing. And like I don't really know what the problem is other than maybe he's just not that good. But Andy Isabella looked great. I mean, he's basically what we all wanted Christian Kirk to be, except he's just Andy Isabella. So I I actually think. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how long Christian Kirk's going to be out for, but Andy Isabella could definitely be someone that uh, you should keep an eye on because he's got to throw the ball elsewhere outside of – I mean, maybe he doesn't actually have to throw the oh, ball shit. anywhere. They besides. might have lost uh, one of their O-line, the Saints. The Saints? Yeah, he's down. Well, oh, good. They can put Latavius Murray in the trenches. <laughs> <laughs> also, it doesn't matter because Kamara is fucking – just nobody can tackle him. So he's he so incredible. Someone, yeah, he could put someone in the back. So I think Andy Isabella is a good pick up there. I think, uh, I think everyone else kind of – kind of stinks let's move on to the next fucking game uh cowboy seahawks this was a very 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 fun game um russ just continues to take a shit on everybody five more <laughs> touchdowns in this one i read a tweet somewhere 14 touchdowns through the first three games is the most by any quarterback in nfl history uh y- you know what you know what it is like they are passing the ball at, at an extremely high rate you know, his pass attempts, while he did hit 40 this week, which is a high number for Russ, like the other two weeks where everyone's like, oh, let Russ cook. Like he wasn't actually throwing the ball that much. The uh, What they were doing is it was just at a very high passing rate, which is what they don't typically do. And it makes the offense so much more efficient, which is why Russ looks so fucking good. And, you know, he's front runner uh, to win the MVP. And I don't think anyone's within like fucking 10 miles of him. DK yeah, and Tyler Lockett both do their thing and just dominate through the air. DK Metcalf fucking fumbles the ball <laughs> like, oh, like, a, like an asshole and let's go another touchdown. But – um, Chris Carson, I guess, is the big injury news here. That was a dirty play. Did you guys see it? Yeah. yeah the, like, the little alligator roll. He, like, rolled up on it yeah, real quick. Yeah. Fucking it straight, fucking... straight barrel roll. Yeah, he just took that shit and was like, "It's a, your leg's coming with me. And he fucking tried to, <laughs> tried to spin with it. And uh, don't know the severity of it. I'm not even really sure. I didn't see any doctors, like, tweet about it, what they think it could be. I don't think something like that will cause – like a, a serious tear in any way, but I'll probably just shut the fuck up. I don't. Well, you're a doctor. Don't, diagnose him on the spot. Or we're yeah, gonna call a fantasy football counselor and see what I'm, he says. I'm gonna say sprained MCL out for two to three weeks. But I think the bigger pickup here is probably uh, Travis Homer because Carlos Hyde was uh, kind of useless behind 
uh, Chris Carson and, and Travis Homer seemed to be like the guy that they leaned on down the stretch, although he didn't get, he didn't get that many touches. So it's just something to keep an eye on. And I wouldn't be surprised if Carlos Hyde like took 15 carries next week, but see how severe the Chris Carson injury is. And uh, even if it's a split between Hyde and, and Travis Homer, it's like, you just want players on this team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look, Tyler Lockett, nine receptions, 100 yards and three tutties. DK, four receptions, 110 yards. Should have had two touchdowns, but had one touchdown. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is the double potential wide receiver one stack that no one really saw coming, right? Like we, we both said they're, you know, they're very talented. We thought Tyler Lockett was going to be the guy. You know, he obviously still is a baller, but DK Metcalf obviously making a name for himself aside from that Sean Jackson fucking blunder. Um, but this is a good team. This is a good offense. And their defense fucking stinks. Like, they cannot. Jamal Adams anyone. got hurt too, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they can't stop anyone. Uh, like, they can't, they can't stop the passing game. Uh, I guess they stopped the running game or Zeke stopped himself looking like fucking Jordan Howard out there catching passes. <laughs> you hate to see it. Um, he looked absolutely brutal. Six for 24 through the air. Yeah, you do hate to see that. Yeah, so it, it looked brutal. I mean, but on the flip side – Michael Gallup, man, came back. He's been getting the air yards, finally converted on a couple, looking like a fucking baller. He was a wide receiver one today, by all means. Dak Prescott threw near, damn near 60 times with 37 completions, almost 500 yards, 472 yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions. Uh, look, I mean, th this offense is going to put up points, and, and they're going to be relevant wide receivers all around between Gallup, CD, who also look good, and, uh, and Amari Cooper, who also look good. So, it's going to be an offense that puts up a lot of points. So you got to get guys on these teams. And honestly, I think CeeDee Lamb is someone I'm no longer trading away. Like, there, there's very few players where I, I, I say I, I'm not willing to trade them. But CeeDee Lamb is that person just because his value right now is not going to reflect even remotely what he's going to be. Like, if you thought A.J. Brown had a meteoric rise, like CeeDee Lamb's going to, going to put that one in the rear view. Like, the, the opening that he's had, the way that he's playing, the way he's being used. Trust me when I say this. If you have CeeDee Lamb, just don't trade him. Do not trade him. I have him in the filet, filet league, and there's just like he's on my taxi, and there's no way I'm trading him. Someone like this is how ludicrous it is, like in my mind, right? I'm, like if someone offered me Devonte Adams straight up for CD Lamb, I might just turn him down, just mainly because in that league I don't really need Adams, and I think CD is like just a very secure asset. But that sounds ludicrous. That sounds really stupid. I know people are gonna say I don't like, need that's Adams. Fucking dumb. Yeah, <laughs> like, people are gonna say that that sounds really fucking dumb. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, like just like based on where his value trajectory is going. This is like one of those sure bets for me where I think like his value is going to skyrocket. He's going to be unattainable. Five, yeah, he looks incredible. Season. And I've been telling you guys for weeks to pick up Cedric Wilson. He had his breakout party. <laughs> five for one of seven to three touchdowns. <laughs> no, but for real, going back to the Seahawks, this passing game is fucking incredible. It was like third and three. They're like, Jason Myers would need to hit a 50-yard field goal here. Russell Wilson's like <laughs> up in the press box, throws it 70 yards. DK Metcalf on the other side. That math does not add up at all. But it was like a 40-yard touchdown to DK Metcalf. Like, he doesn't care who's playing defense. He doesn't care what's happening. He's going to lace one down the middle to either DK Metcalf or Tyler Lockett. As you said, Mike, this is going to be like two wide receiver ones in this offense. If DK Metcalf put up two touchdowns on those like four for 111 and two touchdowns, like and Russell Wilson had six touchdowns, I mean, they could retire at this point of, at, of the year and Russell Wilson would have, win MVP. And these guys would be top 24 receivers as it is. But uh, that was a great game, very high scoring. Michael Gallup had that. Uh, breakout party he almost had another one at the end but he was like running way too close to the sideline and Dak Prescott put yeah. it, couldn't put it in his bread basket but uh, I really like all the passing all the like the top two on the Seahawks and the top three on the Cowboys because there's plenty of volume to go around who would you guys rather have right now between DK Metcalf and AJ Brown and Dynasty because you know we haven't seen AJ Brown because he's been hurt uh but we know what he what he's capable yeah. of and I think that's a that's a definitely a close bet like that trio of like AJ Brown DK Metcalf Calvin Ridley that's a it's a tough one, dude. Though. Oh, and yeah. I think I would take Metcalf at this point, man. Just like just tying yourself to Russell Wilson is. It's I don't elite. know if you could like have a more valuable position in Dynasty right now. Yeah. This is yeah, the, I know this we is all the... laughed about like the comparison of Julio Jones, but like it's coming to fruition. Like we laughed at the David uh, David Montgomery was like the athleticism of Sony Michelle, the legs of <laughs> Saquon Barkley. Like this one's looking legit. He cannot be guarded by anybody. Yeah, he is he is elite. This is like the the wide receiver version of why we said draft CH because CH is kind of attached to Patrick Mahomes and gets like that touchdown upside. I mean, DK Metcalf is attached to what I'm gonna call is the best deep ball passer of all time. Uh, yeah, Russ probably. is the best deep ball passer. Have you not ever. watched Justin Herbert for two weeks? <laughs> <laughs> uh, bar none. So the, and like he's not scared to throw it. And you saw the coverage, like the coverage on Gilmore last week. I went back looked at it. It was fucking good coverage. Like doesn't the, matter. 
It just doesn't matter because Russell Wilson drops a fucking dime. Dude, every, in the every drive, I tweeted this out. Like, they're so fun to watch this year because every drive is just, it's one of three things. It's like Chris Carson running super fucking angry, a dart right to Tyler Lockett, or a bomb to DK Metcalf. And like next week, the Seattle coaching staff is going to be so shocked when Chris Carson isn't out there. And then they just continue to do Tyler Lockett, DK, and come away with a win. And they're like, oh shit, like we didn't need to run the ball in order to win. They win by like 45 points. <laughs> This is going to be a funnel to just these two dudes, and it's yeah. gonna it's gonna make beautiful, beautiful fucking babies for fantasy. Yeah. Even Greg Olson, like they were looking at him a lot towards the end of the game. They got that uh, clutch third down. He catches everything. I low key thought it was what's his name out there, Will Disley, and like I almost shed a tear. Like this is the greatest <laughs> comeback story of all time, but not it's forty year old Greg Olson, which is also a pretty decent comeback story because I thought he was done after last year. Okay, so anyone anyone in that game between those five receivers? Let's talk redraft real quick. Is CeeDee Lamb, I'm going back on that point, though, is low-key going to end up with 1,000 yards. If he scored a t- he hasn't scored a touchdown yet. Like, if he scored a touchdown, people will be looking at him so much differently. But, like, yeah. he's consistently 60, 50, 100 yards. Like, it's going to be a crazy, crazy st- statistical season for him because he's consistent as shit, and so is his offense. Like, of these five receivers, uh, are you – like, would you sell Michael Gallup after this big game? Because I feel like – I don't know. I, I think I would. Redraft? I think- yeah, and redraft. This is all redraft stuff I'm talking about. Like, I'm, I'm keeping Cooper. Uh, CD's like, I don't think you'll really be able to sell him for anything right now. Plus, he's not that valuable in redraft. Lockett and Metcalf, if I have them, I'm fucking rolling with them for the rest of the year. But Gallup is the one that I think I would debate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough, right? Like, we we I, we I always said, like, as soon as CD Lamb, Lamb got drafted, we're like, yo, this guy's going to be the wide receiver of the future. He's going to usurp Michael Gallup. I did not foresee it happening like this early. I will say, though, Gallup is still getting the air yards. So he's getting those deep targets, the valuable targets. Um, but he's going to be pretty inconsistent. Did he break up? Yeah. Uh, Mike's, Mike's, Mike, Mike's just frozen on me. I'm going to take a screenshot. It's a funny-ass face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, really hard to trade, like, wide receivers after, like, some of these blows. Hey, there he goes. Sorry, you just, like, cut out for about 11 seconds. Oh, really? Yeah, we'll, so you were we'll, saying we'll said. Uh, Michael Gallup is getting air, he's getting a lot of air yards, but he's going to come with a lot of inconsistencies. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, you're just not going to be able to trust him that much. But having said that, like, it, it's really hard to to trade like wide receivers. That's what I found. Like, to, to trade like like these like wide receiver twos, like these like fringe wide receivers, like nobody needs them because in redraft no. you can just pick them up everywhere. So it's it's like, just, this year, more than anything, just like really. You know, we, we, we talked about it all summer. We're just like, you need the running backs. You need the running backs. You need the running backs. And, like, I got running backs early, and I'm still trying to, like, sell off some of my wide receivers that I got in the later rounds. Like, I have the, the team with, like, Thielen, Lockett, Terry McLaurin, Will Fuller, and, like, nobody wants any part of them. And I'm just like, fuck. I look at their team, and I'm like, shit, you, like, there's no team that actually needs a fucking wide receiver. Like, it, none of them have value. Yeah. yeah, I think for Michael Gallup, too, it's like, the price that you're going to sell him for isn't going to be worth any type of return because if you do play him in your flex, there's always that off chance that he puts up six for 130 in a touchdown because he's being used deep down the field. The Dallas Cowboys offense can't really stop anybody and they just keep airing the ball out. So uh, I just probably like if you can get a decent enough like wide receiver to return, like if you can get a Tyler Boyd in return for him, I'd go for it. But I just don't see that happening. I don't think people are really buying into a one off performance from Michael Gallup and going to pay a price reasonable enough to ship him off. All right, uh, that's going to wrap up the last game, and you heard it here first. Uh, according to Noah, Greg Olson, wide receiver one in the Seattle <laughs> hey, Cedric offense. Cedric Wilson, that, that's what I called out. No, Cedric Wilson, wide receiver one, Greg Olson, wide receiver one in Seattle. Both, both guys under the radar you could pick up and, and start immediately. Okay, that's it. Um, so, again, this will be our normal Wednesday show. We will be going back to our normal regular regularly scheduling tomorrow i will be going live on youtube to talk waiver wire and more of uh, an in-depth recap with you know snaps and air yards and that kind of nonsense that we don't have access to yet for this week make sure you are subscribed to the bunk bed breakdowns youtube channel because they're doing a ton of dynasty shit uh day in and day out and the waiver wire article will be out on patreon tomorrow afternoon Our dynasty rankings will be out October 1st. Also Patreon. So patreon.com forward slash BDGE. That's it. Hit the thumbs up. If you enjoyed, subscribe to the channel if you're new. And we'll see you all next Wednesday. Don't forget to watch the Market Watch Mondays because we're launching that in our regular scheduled time because we don't fucking disappoint at Big Dog's headquarters every single week. So you're going to get two times of videos. Open up your fucking brain. We've got big facts on this one, big facts on that one, big facts all around. Are you... Are you done?